John Gersimer is the CEO of Harry's Poll. And John, uh, I mean, you do uh, research and polling on, on, on COVID uh, and also on a lot of brands. I mean, your, your, your company is really sort of a brand tracking platform, right? Um, and, 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 and by that, I mean, uh, it's really a real-time information platform about brands and about uh, events and about marketing. You know, I grew up uh, during a time when marketing research Uh, you know, in companies about brands was done, I don't know, maybe every, every half a year or maybe a little bit more frequently every two or three months. But nowadays, it's, it's all, always about, uh, you know, real time and instant. Uh, I hear you have prepared quite a, a, a solid deck that you will share with us, uh, focused also on politics and, and the American business, right? That's sort of the title of the presentation. Right. And this morning already in the Bright Conference, of course, not only COVID came up here and there, but also DEI. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as other sort of uh, more more socio political issues. Um, so I very much look forward to your presentation. Uh, I've, I, I mean, you spoke to a, my, my, a branding executive program at Columbia recently, but each time we talk to you, there's always something new. There's always new data. Uh, so this will be a, a, it will be very interesting for me personally also to hear what what's what's going on in the marketplace these days. So. I'll, Hand it over to you. I may uh, jump in here and there and ask you a follow-up question, right? But uh, uh, otherwise, you know, uh, the next half an hour is all um, to you in terms of sharing uh, information about the market with us. Thank you. Great, great, Bern. Thanks very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, we um, sort of a little bit like ripped from the headlines. We fielded some proprietary research over the past weekend to try to understand how Americans thought of the role of business and speaking out on social issues vis-a-vis uh, -vis the most recent uh, issues of businesses being thrust into the spotlight over the, uh, the Georgia voting laws. So we created a bunch of different hypotheticals that I'm going to take you through at the back half of this deck, but I want to kind of set the stage first by looking at some of our uh, Harvard Harris Poll and our Harris Poll COVID tracking data to give you a bit of a sense of what we have seen as sort of systemic inequalities that um, in the minds and the voices of ordinary Americans that really the pandemic has brought to bear because understanding that context will help sort of explain a little bit about uh, people's attitudes kind of when we get deeper into it. So let me share my screen. So let's start and um, kind of look at the broad state of the, um, of the country. And clearly um, there's a lot of optimism in, in the United States. This is a uh, brand new uh, data from just about two weeks back in our Harvard Harris poll where we talked to American voters. And you can see for the first time in our polls history, um, basically those that think the country's on the right track has eclipsed uh, those on the wrong track. So sort of similarly coming out of other, you know, pandemics or other crises, Americans are kind of feeling good about where things are heading. And one of the drivers of that is really the sense that um, they believe that their personal economic situation is improving. If you look at that green line, you can see kind of back in about February of, of 2020 of last year, right into March, you can see the significant drop in, in optimism from 38% to 21%, you know, as the economy shed jobs and, and we entered into the dark days of the pandemic. But you can see how that green line has trended back up. We're back up now at sort of pre-pandemic levels, almost at 30%. And equally important, the number of people that are pessimistic, thinking the economy is getting worse for them personally, is continuing to decline uh, down to 21%. The other thing that's uh, hopeful is that for the first time, there's a little bit more mind space for Americans to contemplate something else than the economy and Corona. And obviously these two have been intertwined for the last 12 to 13 months in the American psyche, but we're seeing that both of those concerns as top issues facing the country are starting to decline. And in its place are some of the old fashioned issues from 2019, right? Immigration, which is back up, uh, guns in the wake of, of the recent uh, tragedies, including uh, last night in Indianapolis, is continues to be something that is, is taking the minds of Americans And we're going to get into this concept of political correctness and cancel culture in just a second. But when we look at our trended data, which looks at um, weekly sort of things that Americans feared during COVID, I just want to carve out like one really quick kind of look at uh, fear of losing one's job, which is at the bottom of that line at, um, at the orange line. 
and fear of dying, uh, which is green. And you can kind of see um, those numbers are sort of stable and declining at about 47% and 46% on the right-hand side, respectively. But what you started to see, and we saw during the crisis, is that the pandemic did not hit all uh, Americans equally. And so we saw, for example, fear of losing one's job spiked significantly among Gen Z and millennial Americans versus boomers. That is a significant difference in terms of, of concern over losing uh, their job with 50, about at that point, about 50 being the mean. And then look at the difference between Hispanic Black Americans versus white Americans on fear of dying from COVID. That's just a tiny snapshot. We could go through all this data and you would see how many different types of disparities exist, but I'll just touch on a few for, for a second. Uh, the first thing it's really important to know is that the concept of this K-shaped recovery is a real thing in ordinary American households. We have more than half of Americans feeling that they've faced significant personal financial crisis from COVID. And as you kind of look through that list, you can kind of see anywhere from 57% uh, all the way up to 74% at the top, you can see all the different sort of expressions of hardship where they felt very or somewhat severely affected on missing mortgage or bill payments, losing income partially or losing access to their health insurance. Now, other casualties of, of the pandemic were clearly women. America's women were disproportionately impacted, especially among Black and Hispanic women in our data. And we asked these questions on a scale of one to 10, how much do you agree with the following statement? Looking at the at sort of the top two box rating, um, we saw significantly lower numbers of women reporting confidence in their personal financial situation, their ability to afford to buy food, their access to financial services, um, all these sort of different aspects in and around finance and other parts of access to our society were very much cut off uh, to America's women. And also we saw digital inequities exposed during the pandemic. Again, when we look at the black Americans on the green line versus um, general population in beige or white Americans in orange, look at the Delta differences between saying that they had a poor rating under four um, on a 10 point scale against questions like, my children have the technology equipment needed to attend online school, or that I have access to telehealth services or mobile banking, or even that I have the necessary technological equipment needed to work from home during the pandemic. These are significant differences. On that last point, look at that. 32% of black Americans versus 13% of the general public or only 7% of white Americans saying that they had a poor rating on that question. And again, the story continues to kind of repeat its pattern. Um, under household incomes of under 50K, significantly greater stress on these types of, of inequities. We also saw infrastructure inequities. This is today in America, and this is really remarkable, but two thirds of Americans cite their drinking water in their area as sort of okay or poor or excellent or good, but oh, almost a third, more than a third, 37% say okay or poor. And again, those numbers pop among Black and Hispanic Americans vis-a-vis -vis white Americans and also under household incomes. It's important to note the EPA now says that more than 30 million Americans um, as of last year lived in areas where water systems violated safety rules in 2020. With this, um, We'll turn and look at vaccinations. We'll talk about one more aspect of this inequity before we get into the, into the data and focus here. One of the things that we now know is that 23% of Americans are now vaccinated uh, as of this past weekend. But with that comes a hesitancy among those who are not yet vaccinated. And this is looking at um, our data kind of continually. We've been doing this each week uh, since the vaccines were, were launched. And we can kind of see, you know, that. 18% say they plan to go the first day. 37% say they've already received the vaccine. It's really interesting. That's the same number as the number of Americans that, that have both doses uh, as of this past weekend. But then look at the numbers at the bottom. Whenever I get around to it, I will wait and see, or I will not get a COVID vaccine. Those numbers continue to grow, which threatens um, the prospects of herd immunity. This is some data that we just conducted with the CDC. 
Now, because of that, one of the factors is the systemic racism and bias in our healthcare system. If you look at these numbers, again, the difference between white Americans in green and black Americans, um, sorry, black Americans in, in gray, you can see the significant difference in lack of trust. Um, big, big, actually, this is mislabeled. This should be the other way. Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. But we're seeing significant uh, sort of differences in lack of trust. So how much do you trust the opinions of people when it comes to the COVID vaccine? Um, look at the difference in trust in my doctor between white and black Americans. That is incredibly significant difference. And all the way down the line, you can see that there's a significant mistrust in the healthcare system, pharmacists, um, anyone is sort of associated with it because of the legacy of, of racism that has existed in the healthcare system toward uh, black Americans. We also see that uh, in terms of their confidence in even getting the vaccine on the right hand side. And so with that, one of the things that's sort of shaking all the, the, the pandemic's impact and in these inequities are the tensions that are changing in social values. It's a function of the pandemic. It's a function of, of Black Lives Matter and, and all the push for racial justice in our country since, since the tragic events over Memorial Day. And now we start to see, um, obviously, the impact on national division being brought to the spotlight vis-a-vis -vis January 6th. And one of the, the casualties from that is sort of a calcifying in America and a shifting of some of the bedrock reputation of, of institutions uh, in America. So the US military still holds very strong at an 80% favorability rate. The police have come way back up from last summer. Um, they're at 72 to 19%. I'm gonna skip through a couple of these and just call a couple out. I mean, one that does uh, that's very sort of sobering is when asked um, the reputation, overall favorability of the Black Lives Matter movement, that was 55-25 last summer, and that has continued to drop down due to some of the politicization of the movement and associated with sort of violence over peaceful protests. At the same time, you can see the enormous unpopularity of social media platforms. We're gonna get into that a bit more and look at the hypocrisy or sort of the contradiction or, trench, or tensions that exist uh, among Americans on some of these issues. So we asked this question slightly different way. We said, how much do you oppose or support Black Lives Matter movement? And you can see two thirds of Americans as of this past weekend still support it, significantly higher among Democrats than Republicans. But at the same time, Americans also don't want to defund the police. There are only 20% of Americans that would support a program as of today to defund police and create new systems of policy uh, pol poli policies for police departments versus other types of reform, but the defunding is sort of off the table. The same goes with questions around DACA. We both support DACA, but the majority of Americans at 52% don't believe we should halt um, continuing building the border wall. Same sort of story exists on, on infrastructure and climate change, as well as sort of shootings and lack of tough gun laws. Again, Americans, 56% um, don't see a relationship between infrastructure and climate change, nor do they see the recent uh, spate of mass shootings tied to a lack of tough gun laws. That's only a third of Americans versus the belief of mental illness being the driving factor there. So with these tensions and the way that we sort of see things, there's a tendency obviously to need to have free speech and open dialogue well, that's also not happening because of cancel culture. Cancel culture has become a big thing, particularly on, on the more um, conservative side of America, but it's become a topic and an issue among voters. In fact, we asked American voters in our Harvard-Harris poll, have you, are you familiar or unfamiliar with the idea of cancel culture? 64% are very or somewhat familiar, and 36% of them, including 52% of Republicans, believe it's a big problem and 32% uh, say it's a moderate problem. So roughly two thirds are aware and think it's a problem. And yet at the same time, over half of the voters are starting to think about this issue on a personal level. And we ask this question, are you concerned or not concerned that if you express your true viewpoints online, you might be banned or fired? 54% of Americans are concerned about that. And then similarly, do you think there's a growing cancel culture that is a threat to your freedom or not? Again, two thirds of Americans roughly believe this to be the case. 
And so as a result, the most mistrusted institution in America right now is social media. It has a higher distrust uh, than Congress uh, or even the national media or some of the other aspects of, of institutions that are sort of under siege right now for being doubted or politicized. And as a result, 70% of Americans on the right hand side support regulations through Congress to regulate social media platforms. And John, so, can I just stop uh, in for a moment? So do, do they trust you? Do they trust pollsters? That's a great question. Uh, that depends on which polling pollsters you're asking. <laughs> um, public opinion is very much a sort of fickle issue. You know, when we look at these numbers burn, you know, continually a function of sort of trust is the ability to sort of be transparent and to represent these views on both sides. And one of the things that we obviously try to do is try to argue both sides of an argument in order to maintain objectivity. But there, no, there's definitely significant mistrust in sort of how polling is either used in media, how it's sort of uh, represented, and that creates doubt the same way you see on the, on the left. I mean, hand side of the slide. The point of my question is also, I mean, we've known in all of research always the idea of a, a you know, response bias, demand characteristics, you know, you say what you think the person wants to hear that is polling you, for example. Um, and since um, there seems to be the suspicion that you, you, know, you know, you cannot say your opinion. Some people seem to be saying that you showed us just the data. Um, so, um, and there's the concern about, uh, you know, that people are listening on you, right? With yes. the social media. Um, I mean, is, is, is that becoming an issue? And, and how are you getting around it? How are you getting around getting people's real opinion? Well, I think the important thing is to ask questions in lots of different ways so that you can sort of triangulate uh, people's opinions. We also supplement a lot of our, of our polling work, uh, which is all done exclusively online uh, in order to sort of allow enough anonymity for people to give their, um, their honest opinions, hopefully. But that's not always the case. You're, you're absolutely correct. So other methods include sort of follow-ups and taking smaller samples and talking to those people to try to see if your qualitative samples are lining up with uh, with what's being said quantitatively, but it continues to be a big issue. And that was definitely an issue in, in the 2016 election where there were lots of shy Trump voters, you know, people that, that had social desirability bias. So one of the things that we're gonna get to when we look at this next section is sort of trying to create more tension in some of these questions and actually get Americans to not think about themselves, but to imagine themselves as CEOs and talk about what they would do to try to get their opinions to kind of come to the surface in a truthful way. Should we look at some of that? Yes. Okay. Um, so the first thing it's important to know in this sort of, we, I guess we call this half hour talk showdown, right? The showdown is sort of politics versus business, uh, particularly conservative politics versus business. And these were long, very good friends, right? They were sort of partners in arms in, in pursuit of lower taxes. And suddenly they're sort of at odds. And um, the first most important thing to know is that business did really well during um, COVID, uh, high degrees of respect. And you can see in these numbers between sort of two thirds and three quarters of Americans thought that um, business did a better job than the federal government. They were more reliable, they were more trusted and they're actually more needed uh, in terms of you know, tackling not only uh, a, a recovery from the pandemic, but also a look at dealing with some of our other bigger social problems in America, including racial injustice and other equalities. Basically, they want businesses to get involved and to fill some of the leadership void that's been created uh, by Congress and the president and the federal government. So we started to ask some questions and, um, we were said, you know, put yourself in the mind of a CEO and tell us sort of which um, stakeholders should a CEO listen to most. And the first thing we can kind of see here is that Americans say CEOs should listen to their customers first, then their employees, um, and then their shareholders, and lastly, communities. Now, the story isn't really burnt in the in the aggregate numbers, it's in the demos and in the differences between the demos. That's where the margin of opinion really changes. And this is going to build the foundation of the end of my argument about why business needs to really um, sort of pay attention, not to today's consumer, but the generational shifts that are going to be making up sort of tomorrow's marketplace. 
But here you can see, for example, customer centricity, boomers are twice as likely at 50% versus Gen Z and millennials to think that's the most important audience for CEOs to listen to. When you look at Gen Z and millennials, they want um, CEOs to listen to employees more versus boomers, right? That's a nine point difference at 29% versus 20. They uh, are less emphasized on shareholders and they're more emphasized on communities. Again, a double digit difference or almost an eight percent, uh, eight point difference between Gen Z and boomers on that issue. So their sense of authority is sort of spread out. The story gets a little more interesting when you start to ask really direct questions like, do you think CEOs have become more or less active in expressing your political views or that of your company? Well, right now, Americans say they're doing about the same, 43, but even more at 44% say they're being more political. Now, clearly this upsets boomers more. They have a stronger opinion about it. Uh, boomers plus means boomers and seniors. Uh, they're at 50%, but look at a 20 point difference between boomers and Gen Z. What Gen Z are essentially saying is that CEOs aren't political enough. They're not doing enough to really be speaking out on social issues. And this is a pattern in a lot of our Harris poll data that younger viewers uh, of both Republicans and Democrats, younger Americans rather, are more progressive on speaking out on social issues. Also, we asked, do you think CEOs being more active in expressing their own political views, is that a good or a bad thing for the company? Again, good for the company, 32%, bad for the company, 46%. More Americans think that's bad again, driven by older audiences. But look at the differences um, between good for the company, millennials versus boomers, that is a 37 point swing. That just shows you how different the opinion is based on age on that issue. Similarly for bad for the, for the company, boomers again driving this, boomers and seniors, you got a 34 point swing there again. So. What's happening is that there's very divergent views. We always talk about America being sort of divided by Democrats and Republicans. There is a significant younger and BIPOC difference between older white Americans on a range of issues related to speaking out. And we see that in this next chart. We asked with everything so divisive today, which of the following is best for companies? Um, First, uh, the majority at 52% said companies should focus on their products and services, uh, not on their social issues. Again, a very pragmatic thing to do, great thing to do in an ideal world, 52%. Um, look again at the difference between white and black Americans, 18 points uh, difference in terms of, of black Americans agreeing with that viewpoint versus white. Similarly, the difference between Gen Z, 15 points, uh, disagreeing essentially versus the public and 28 points disagreeing versus uh, boomers on that topic. The same story goes um, on it's best to take a stand on social issues, even if it would offend people. That's a, a roughly a third of Americans. But again, look at the difference between black and white Americans uh, on that topic. And the story goes the same. We ask what's, what's a bigger risk, speaking out or not speaking out? And again, two thirds almost believe that in speaking out, the company has inserted itself into a political issue. It's bound to alienate and frustrate some people. Clearly that's a big difference. But again, black Americans are far more focused on speaking out as are younger Americans. And we really call this, you know, 36% of the general public believes in not speaking out. They've signaled their indifference and look at how millennials and black Americans agree with that. And so this is really the bind that most businesses find themselves in today. On one hand, getting caught in a divisive topic, and on the other hand, being perceived with the optics of indifference, which is sort of a, a, a corporate communications crisis in its own right, oftentimes. Now, lastly, before we get into the specific Georgia law to finish this up, I know I'm running short on time. Um, we see that young people actually equate social activism with customer acquisition. We asked when CEOs speak out on social issues, what do you think they're trying to accomplish most? 42% said they're attracting new customers. 31% said influencing the stock price and 27% engendering 
uh, goodwill. And then we asked, is there more risk or reward in CEOs speaking out on social issues? Again, more pragmatic, more conservative is are the general public. They say there's more risk at 59% than reward at 41%. But yet again, the differences are in the numbers based on age and ethnicity. We see 14 point swing with black Americans where they see less risk and more reward vis-a-vis -vis white Americans. And the same sort of story goes with younger people. Look at the difference between Gen Z at 56% believing there's more reward versus 28% of boomers more reward. That again is a 28 point swing. So lastly, companies speaking out on state laws. We went straight to the heart of the issues of Georgia. We didn't ask specifically the issues on Georgia, but we wanted to put people in the mindset of being a CEO and ask for their opinions. So we said, should they speak out against companies speaking out against laws that they disagree with? 62%, nearly two thirds say, if the company morally disagrees with the law, it's important that they voice their opinion. 38% say stay out of politics. Again, those who say to voice their opinion tend to be women, black, Hispanic, Gen Z, and um, making less than 50,000. At the same time, those that say stay out of politics tend to be male, white, uh, Republican, and a little bit more well off. Then we asked, um, what if you were a CEO of a company and new legislation had been passed in your state that goes against company values that are publicly known, would you make a statement voicing your opposition to this new law? 69% said speaking out uh, is worse than staying silent. Now, no, the potential for boycotting and alienation would be too big to take a stand at 31%. Again, significant differences on opinions between uh, Black Americans and white and millennials versus other age groups. Again, supporting the importance of speaking out. And then lastly, um, if you asked uh, the new law, we're facing financial repercussions for doing so. However, employees of your company had made it clear that they want you to make a statement. What would you do? Again, here in the affirmative, uh, three quarters of Americans say make a statement because my employees are more important than the potential repercussions. I'm just gonna pause it for a second. That's is significant. That's Americans understanding now the power of labor inside companies and the, and the importance of employees and why companies are compelled sometimes to do the things uh, that they are doing. And again, we see big differences based on ethnicity, party and age. Now, lastly, we see CEOs are like politicians. They have the rights to speak out if they're directly impacted. And you can see sort of those numbers here that kind of support that. I'll send the deck around if you guys wanna read it later. But I wanted to kind of get to, because I know we're, we're at the end, my last two slides. It's so important to understand for business that today is not necessarily as important as tomorrow. And what I mean by that is when you look at the Brookings Report analysis of the new US census data, in 1980, 80% um, of the country was white. In 2019, 60% of it is white. And you can now see as of the latest census, four in 10 Americans identify with a race other than white. Since 2010, white population has declined in all 50 states except Washington, DC. Think about that for a second. And then lastly, you see the trends around younger uh, people that are driving all the growth in our country are coming uh, from being Latino, Hispanic, or black. So the basic idea in, in sort of conclusion is that I think there are probably new qualities for CEOs. We asked Americans and they are saying CEOs that are admired today have high ethics, high trust, as well as high vision, but they also have to be humble, they have to be empathetic, and they have to have consistency and steadiness. And to me, that almost sounds like a playbook for the sort of future CEO business school uh, as we look ahead. So hopefully that gave us a little bit of a, a look at some of our data. And I wanted to make sure I stayed on time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, we have a lot of follow-up questions that, uh, for example, talk about further analysis by age, by cohort, by you know ethnicity, by gender identity, and so on. And uh, and we and Matt has put into the chat a link 
uh, to the reports. So I'm sure in the reports there's there's some 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 more details uh, on that. Um, I mean the. It, it, Okay, so what we are hearing here is that a, a certain generation, uh, you know, wants basically a CEO also to take uh, political uh, opinions and that that would be rewarded, right? Now, my question is, is it about saying something about politics or is it, say, is it about saying something that I agree with? It's really about saying something and if you do something, it has to be done in the interest of your employees and it has to be done in the context of your vision. Um, clearly what they're not looking for, for companies to sort of get out there and have a, a broad conversation about any issues in society. They feel that if something happens and particularly if it happens in a state that you operate in, there's more data behind all this that we didn't get into, then you must be compelled to sort of act. And so this is a little bit about, you know, like if you're threatened in a fight, you know, is it fight, fight or flight? Right. And they're kind of saying that CEOs, men and women have the latitude on behalf of their employees to sort of speak out and to potentially take action. But again, the other part of the data is saying, don't go looking for fights. Don't go into places where you're not affected personally um, and do things that are consistent with your values. Okay, um, another question that came up early on was actually, how do you collect the data and are they representative of the US population? Yes, absolutely. I, I should have said that at the beginning, all the Harris Poll methodologies are, are sort of highly vetted um, in our work, both with Harvard and in our work um, with the CDC and our, our polls. These are all nationally representative samples, meaning that they are collected samples to represent uh, the demography of the United States. Okay, and then um, how do you choose the issues? I mean, you, you shared certain issues with us, uh, but, 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 but how, do you, how do you come up with which ones you pull? Yeah, I mean, with these last set of questions we just talked about for the last 10 minutes, this was a little bit of a um, sort of looking at the headlines and trying to see how the public felt about these because obviously we had a, a number of CEOs sign on to the, uh, to the letter that really uh, critiqued and, and, and challenged the, the Georgia voting laws. And so we wanted to go kind of go out and, and understand that. But we continue to sort of be in the, in, in the field, you know, constantly. We're in the field probably five nights a week asking questions that are sort of related to things that are going on in culture. 